Welcome back to Small Caps. My name's Kerry Stevenson. Today, I'm bringing you a company by the name of Farmost. The ASX code for Farmost is PAA. Joining me today is their executive chairman, Dr. Roger Aston. Roger, good to see you again up there in Oxford. We're down here in Australia. You can't get back here at the moment, but uh, at least we can talk to you. Thank you, Kerry. Um, well, first, let me uh, say a couple of things about Monopantel, which um, we're going to be speaking about. Yep. Uh, it's basically uh, a registered drug. It's used in sheep uh, for veterinary applications in sheep in Australia. And we've taken it with the intention of repurposing it for uh, a, ver a variety of uh, indications. The main ones are cancer and, of course, COVID-19, which, which I'll speak to in a moment. Um, why? Why have we picked this drug? Well, we've picked it because it's registered and it's going into food chain animals. And, the, and as such, there's a great deal of information on it. So we could have an accelerated uh, program to take us to market. Um, and we're, we try to be thorough. We've uh, released the information in our Leiden announcement, Leiden being a university in the ne Netherlands, basically saying that um, and we can inhibit the SARS virus that causes COVID-19. Oh, wow. And this is the, yeah, in, indeed. And this is the third study. We were quite surprised. So we have actually done this in three centers, two in Melbourne and one in the Netherlands. And we've confirmed in all three that uh, it is an antiviral or has antiviral activity and it slows down the SARS virus pro proliferating in various models that are run in basically using human cells in culture. So um, we're pretty confident that we're seeing a relevant effect and we've now got two objectives to pursue. Firstly, to determine the results, whether the results are specific for COVID or whether it is actually a broader spectrum antiviral. If it's the latter, then the market expands substantially because there's many, many viral diseases, which mm. uh, have, including HIV and, and so on. So um, that's the, the first aim is to find out whether or not the, um, the drug is specific for COVID or has other applications for other viral diseases. And the second intention or uh, focus is to do a clinical trial in man and see if we can slow down COVID uh, proliferation, the virus proliferating and uh, sending patients into um, intensive care. If you can slow down that process or in inhibit that process, then of course we, we would have a very major product on our hands. And, and, and a game changer. <laughs> yeah, I think it would be a, ma a major game changer. Um, it, I mean, COVID, as we know, all know, kills millions of people to date. And we think that um, even reducing the inflammation associated with the disease may have may pay big dividends. So it's not only just as an antiviral, but the whole cascade that follows. There's several steps in there that you could try to inhibit and uh, come up with a product. I want to come. Uh, I, I want to talk about timelines in a moment. But one of the things you mentioned in the announcement on COVID nineteen <laughs> is that the drug solubility, and I think I pronounced that correctly has been a bit challenging in these studies. Um, can you just elaborate a little bit further on that? And is that going to be um, an issue in the clinic? We don't think so. Um, firstly, I should say that drug delivery and drug targeting are uh, always a challenge in medicine, particularly when you've got a highly insoluble uh, product. Uh, you've got to get it into solution for it and into the bloodstream for it to have activity. Uh, and indeed, many blockbuster drugs had, have had major solubility issues. Having said that, we've re reformulated the drug into a tablet with the right excipients, the solubilizing agents. And that's really what we're using at the moment in our current uh, canine cancer trial. And uh, we think this will be the same product that we put into humans uh, as soon as we go into the human trials. So I think that problem has been resolved. <clears throat> That's good to know. Uh, is, is, there a, is there a timeline? I, I did want to, I'm kind of curious, is there a timeline for the trials, the human trials? Um, there is a timeline. We've got uh, three trials that we're targeting. One of them is, of course, for COVID, which we've just been uh, talking about. Mm. But we've also just received uh, approval for a major grant from FITEMND, which 
uh, will be the first trial that will be evaluated. And you might well say, well, how is it that Monopanto works in COVID-19 and it works in cancer? And now you're telling me uh, it's going to have application in uh, motor neuron disease, which is a, a mm. very devastating disease. Oh, absolutely. And many people have to live with it. <clears throat> so um, uh, we presented the data to uh, our, our a team that were working, who were working on uh, motor neuron disease, and by the mechanism of action, they felt confident that it may have application in motor neuron disease. So um, they've awarded us this grant, a major grant, over eight hundred thousand uh, dollars, to evaluate our tablets that we have been reformulating uh, in patients in order to see if we can delay onset or or stop progression. So, so, and by the way, motor neuron disease, I tell you, anyone that can do something with that has my absolute blessing. What an awful, awful disease. So it sounds to me like Moni Pantel potentially has some diverse applications, activities. It does, and it operates through a mechanism called mTOR, which stands for Mechanistic Target for Rapamycin. And that mechanism is actually adopted by a number of drugs already in the market. So we, we know we're on a mechanism of action which has a lot of commercial potential. L literally billions of dollars are being oh. made on mTOR-based drugs. Um, and it's just trying to find our niche and the, what distinguishes us very much from all the other mTOR drugs, like rapamycin, which I mentioned, is that we have a very, very low toxicity. And okay. perhaps that's not yeah, perhaps that's not actually a surprise because it's already registered for food chain animals, uh, which you would not you would not want to be giving a very toxic substance to. So it's a very benign drug in that respect. So we can give large doses without uh, adverse events, basically. And I guess it, that, that that kind of and I think you mentioned this before. That kind of shortcuts a lot of things, doesn't it? Because it's actually already in use. So you've got the, you understand a lot more about the drug. It's just that you're, you're using it, you're looking at it for different applications, but it's past lots of safety and efficacy issues. It's in the market. Um, you're just changing it a little bit for its application. We are, and you're absolutely right <clears throat> that we can um, accelerate the, the, the program in the sense, and it's not just the efficacy and the safety and but it's also the formulation. It's already in the market. It's already been solubilized. We're using a different solubilization uh, method because what currently is being used isn't doesn't work for us. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, repurposing means that some other company or some other person has gone out there and satisfied the TGA in Australia and satisfied the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration in the United States and the European authorities that this drug is safe and this drug has uh, an effect in, uh, uh, is, is an active drug. Um, the difference is that the part of the drug that's active in veterinary uh, for the sheep, which it's already registered for, is different from the part of the molecule which is now being evaluated in cancer, both in canines and humans. We've already done one human trial in cancer in, at the Royal Adelaide Hospital. Uh, some time ago. So we're, we're excited now. Uh, we, we've sort of filled in the gaps with what's been in the you know public domain. And uh, we can now see the targets pretty clearly. Well, it's, it's a lot of exciting stuff coming up. And I, I know you've made great inroads with uh, things and there's mm -hmm. lots of events in the coming months. But when do you anticipate, I guess, more on the partnering, if you could Talk to me more about partnering and licensing and how that's going to play out. That's a, it's an interesting question. And because we've got a number of applications, um, I suspect one company is going to license all of them uh, in one go uh, wow. it, um, to avoid cross prescription. If you've got two companies with different aspects, you might find that doctors are cross prescribing. But having said that, um, uh, I, th I think, Licensing will be straightforward once we have uh, either canine clinical trials successfully completed or human clinical trials successfully completed for both uh, um, MND, uh, cancer, COVID. And uh, once you've got some human data under your belt, um, that's pretty well the proof in the pudding. That will um, uh, 
uh, be the basis of the license agreement. What, can you, can, uh, am I allowed to push you on this one and go, do you, do you have any sort of timeline around that? Yes, we do. I mean, the MND trial will be uh, started, we hope, in Q4 this year. And I, I say that a little bit hesitantly because there's so many delays in our industry because of supplies of oh, yeah. chemicals to make the drugs. Uh, we manufacture our product in India at Sinjin International. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a massive surge at the moment of COVID in India. I don't know if it's been mm -hmm. in the news in Australia, oh, yeah. but yeah, it's... Um, it, it's it. There are delays all the time popping up, um, but we're pushing ahead, and we hope to start the MND trial in late uh, 2021 and embark on the human cancer trials in Q1 22. Not very, not very far away in terms of all, drug no. trials. So that's pretty exciting. Yes, and uh, it's it's not as if we're twiddling our thumbs between now and then. It's all the basics are being put into place, such as how many tablets, blood levels um, uh, in the canine trial that we're currently uh, undertaking, we're very much at the optimization stage where we're taking bloods and looking at uh, how often to give the tablet and what dose in the tablet. You give a large dose to begin with and then a maintenance dose to move on. So all this stuff needs to be worked out before you go into humans. Oh, absolutely. You need, uh, to, you need to, to maximize your chances. Well, of course you do. Um, you've, uh, this is a uh, out there one, um, Roger, you've had many, many years in, in the sort of the biotech, the drug space. I just love to know what attracted you to, to this particular one. Can you see the application being vastly wider mm -hmm. than it currently is? I mean, uh, because of your experience, I guess I'm just curious as to what attracted you to this particular company and this opportunity. Well, we um, we founded the company basically to commercialize Monopanto. Uh, Monopanto is registered. So we already knew that someone out there, some company out there, uh, which I won't mention their name, but they're probably the largest pharma company on the globe, uh, has spent a lot of money and done a lot of work on uh, the toxicology and the safety of the drug. And when I say a lot of work, I mean, they would have probably spent many, many, many millions of dollars uh, doing the safety studies and getting it into the marketplace. So for us, little guys, small companies, micro crap, perhaps, uh, and, and so on, having all that data available gives us a, a, a big push forward. Mm. Um, how do we use the data? Well, you have to go to some of these companies and say, uh, we'll use your data if you give us cross-reference uh, authority. In other words, that we can go to the FDA or the TGA and say, we've got a letter of cross-reference to all their safety data and efficacy data. Um, but if they say, no, you can, do, you can wait until their patents expire and uh, do the work yourself, which that was another driver for us that the patents are now in the process of expiry over the next year or two. Wow. So we will have a pretty free hand, we hope, uh, to move ahead. But we, we take a, a very um, embracing approach to our uh, licensing. If we can get a licensing deal with a global major, it takes away a lot of the challenges of, of marketing and distribution, which they are very good at. As a micro yes. cap, we are, we are not good at that. We have no... Uh, uh, no people out there in the field with a basket of goodies selling, whereas the big boys do. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense to do that. Uh, any, uh, we've, we've got to finish up now, but any last comments before, because uh, I'm sure I'm going to speak to you again in the near future because there's a lot of news flow coming out from Farmost at the moment. Any final comments before we wrap up? Oh, look, I'd just like to say that we've got three targeted indications coming up over the next 12 months with MND being the first motor neuron disease, being the first one, which we're going to target at, uh, at Q4 uh, this year, all being well. And then the other two will follow. And I'm not just sort of saying that loosely because we have already ha uh, had clinicians who have cancer clinics put their hand up and say, when you're ready to go, uh, please approach us. And uh, so we think the rollout will be fairly quick once we can get into the clinic. 
So there's a lot of news flow coming up. I wish you all the best with it, Roger. Thank you so much for joining us today and uh, all the best with the news flow for the future. Thank you, Kerry. Much appreciated.